in these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Welcome on behalf of Pakhuis de Zwijger and myself to the third edition of the series Pakhuis de Zwijger and Foam developed around Foam Talent um, 2020. So in total we speak to six artists and tonight's program is called Every Woman is a Star, Stereotypes in Culture and Gender. And we have not the least of artists with us tonight. We have um, Aji and Jay from Zurich. Hi, Aji. Very nice to have you with us. Um, Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, and uh, all the way uh, in Thailand, we have Kamalak Sukchai. And uh, we have to inform you that we're, um, we're talking to her uh, through a translator. So it will uh, require some time in between uh, to get the answers and the questions. Uh, so please uh, have some patience with us. Um, so hi, very warm welcome to you, Kamalak, as well. Hello. Hi. So um, both of these artists, they actually create new narratives. So um, by raising questions on stories that uh, are brought to us in different ways. So it's um, through advertising and branding in Aji's case and uh, through folk tales in uh, Common Luck's uh, case. But that's a very simplified way of saying it. So it's very complex and multi-layered work. So that's why we will be discussing this tonight. And uh, I'm glad that I'm not doing this by myself. So I have with me in the studio um, two guests. So on my left, I have um, Rita Weidraugo. Um, she is a freelance programmer and researcher. Welcome. Thank you. And on my right, uh, as all previous times, uh, Amelie Schule. She's the head of projects at Photographie Museum Foam. Welcome. Glad to have you back as well. Um, also, most importantly, welcome to everyone at home. Um, please join our conversation. So if you have any questions, uh, just send them in through Zoom and I will receive them over here and we'll make sure that you're question will be answered by our guests uh, either here at the table or uh, through Zoom. Um, so let's start at this table. Uh, Amelie, as I said, great to have you back. Um, so you've selected six um, artists for these talks. So we're talking to the final two now. So can, can we say that we saved the best for last? <laughs> Well, we can definitely say that. Yeah. And um, I did. Uh, we created this program also together with Miriam Koyman, who is the curator of the exhibition. Um, so she, her spirit is very much in this as well. And um, well, Foam Talent is, of course, our talent program, one of the pillars of the talent program of Foam. And as a result of a talent call, mm -hmm. where we receive around 1,600 entries. That's what we received in 2020 wow. from artists from over 69 countries. So it's really an international selection. And I think... Uh, through the series, uh, we have always paired artists also on the basis of thematics to delve into maybe the visual strategies that they have developed to talk about these. Mm -hmm. And for tonight, it is, yeah, as you said, it's, we saved the best for last. We took the most, uh, well, two very important topics for us today and two really great image makers. And the topics are post-colonialism and feminism. And of course, they are really broad. And I think what is nice about the series where we work with image makers is that we come to the topics and to talk about them through their visual visuals and through their works. And why Kamulak and Aji fit so well together is that yeah. they really work with these striking visuals. It's really strong. There's a female character that's very present in the work. and. Although Aji, of course, uh, she works from the angle of uh, propaganda. She started working on the project and really questions also maybe the connection of capitalism and colonialism, mm -hmm. um, but appropriating a visual language and translating it into her own uh, with a lot of research. And also it's a really a long project that she worked on. And Kamulak, she has a different angle to it, of course, because she comes from using... Uh, the tales and the ways of storytelling that are really typical 
uh, for Southeast Asia, but also that are combining different uh, beliefs and different religions that are, that are uh, from this area. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting how she made her angle uh, into then discussing really feminism through this lens and bringing them together, yeah, just gives you two different strategies to approach those topics. And I'm super curious to hear Rita's reflections on it, but also to hear both of the artists, of course. Yeah. Give a bit their personal. Thank you. That's a, uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, Rita, yeah. welcome. Great to have Thank you, you here. Um, as Amelie said, we have you, we invited you here to give some more perspective, both on the work that we'll be looking at, as well as the broader themes that we'll be discussing. So um, you're a freelance uh, programmer, researcher, curator. Can you explain what do you exactly do? Yeah, this is always a difficult question to answer, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of different things. And I think what connects them is that I like them all. <laughs> and it, in a way, um, what I'm doing is always informed by my interest in popular culture, um, in the African diaspora, my own positionality in it. Um, I started as an anthropologist, or at least I studied anthropology and I did my master's um, in anthropology as well. Yeah. So then I did my research um, at the National Museum of World Cultures, at the Trope Museum, actually at the Research Center for Material Culture, which is a research center for the ethnographic museums in the Netherlands. And there my big question was, what is or what are the struggles and obstacles that you face as an institution whilst you're trying to decolonize, if that's even possible. Yeah. And um, so my interest is also in institutional racism, in the decolonization of institutions, uh, decolonization of oneself. And um, yeah, now I work as a curator in different projects and also as a programmer and um, as a researcher, as a writer, so I do different things. So you came to the right place. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome again. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let's uh, move to our first um, artist. Um, come on, luck. Hi, welcome Hi. again. Very, very, very glad to have you with us here. Um, the work that we'll be looking at is called um, Red Lotus. Um, so could you please start by um, informing us on why the Red Lotus specifically uh, interests you so much? So. Uh, so she's always been you know interested and always questioning in terms of sexuality and gender inequality and what is the beginning and what is the root of it all and in terms of her research it, it uh, in terms of research it said that you know folk tales or fictional stories even though they are fictions, but actually they are um, historical documents of human thoughts. They are the roots of human thoughts and how we behave and how we perceive the world and how we perceive the roles of women today. When <laughs> สิ่งนั้นเป็นแบบนี้ขออะไรแล้วสิ่งที่มันให้เหตุผลนั้นมันกลายเป็นฟิกชั่นหรือเป็นเรื่องเล่าขึ้นมาโอเค so um for example red red lotus although it's in fact an ancient ancient um fictional story uh, which is a perfect example of how you know folk tales has impacted human thoughts and how they um, perceive the roles of women throughout generations um yes Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, as I understood that m are many people are interested in whether these folk tales are actually true, whereas uh, you are much interested in how they are used. So why is this? 
ตัวจริงๆเราไม่ได้สนใจความเป็นจริงหรือเปล่าในเรื่องเล่าเพราะว่าในเรื่องเล่าในทางเอเชียอุตสาหะเนมันจะเต็มไปด้วยสิ่งอัศจรรย์มากมายเลยว่ามีอิทธิฤทธิ์มีอะไรที่เรารู้สึกว่ามันเหนือเหนือธรรมชาติแต่ว่าการมีอยู่จริงของเรื่องเล่ามันความมันเป็นสิ่งที่น่าสนใจมากกว่าเพราะว่าในเรื่องเล่าอ่ะมันจะส่งผลจากรุ่นสู่รุ่นเพราะว่าการมีอยู่ของมัน So as as she mentioned before, um, usually when you think of fictions or when you think of you know folk tales, you think of something that is super natural, something that's almost magical, and something that is almost unbelievable. And um, people don't see as you know the use of historical documents. Even even that, um, she's questioning how fictions or how storytelling. So even though they're so old, but it has Truly influenced and impacted women, um, women's thoughts or human thoughts today, and how they perceive women uh, throughout, you know, generations after generations after generations. And it's not because it can't be used as um, history, but it is actually the history of human thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Great. So it's actually uh, she actually uses uh, stories, uh, tales that exist, and and actually rewrites them to make sure that people actually question question how the um, ideology in it is used today. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, actually, the the work that we're looking at now actually made the cover uh, of the Foam magazine. So, out of all the work, uh, this one was selected. So, I have Emily here. So, um, why why was this uh, work specifically out of all the images? Why did you choose this? Well, of course. There's also the reason that if you do a magazine, it's really good to have a central focus point. Mm. But of course, in this case, of course, the coloring, the super vibrance, but also the layering of the image, it shows a type of photography that uses may maybe a different strategy to image making. Mm -hmm. So it's not a straight out photograph. We can already see that it's fragments put together and immediately as a viewer, you're like wondering and asking what is the role of this woman put in the middle on the lotus? So it has already a lot of references and wonder to, its, as, to itself as an image. Yeah. So of course that makes uh, for a striking cover, but actually the magazine has a rotation of covers. Multiple, it, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it works really well, I think personally for the cover. Um, Rita, um, can, we, can we have a look at um, the previous image? Um, Rita, could you uh, reflect on this image, please? Yeah, well, there's a lot to say, and I also don't want to overstep or say now something that is totally different or mentally different by the artist. Mm. But I think what's very interesting here, and also which I will come back to that later, but how it also relates perhaps to Aji's work, um, is how here, again, the, 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 the woman... So also, again, the, the figure of the woman was, was very evident in your work, I think, and how um, the tills, together with her own idea of who she is or can be, um, kind of fight with each other. So here, like, literally fight with each other, but also how she and her beauty and her passion or sexuality is seen by another, uh, in this case, the, the, the folk tale or... Um, yeah, so, so the, um, come on, like this struggle um, that Rita is describing, is that something, um, yeah, that you recognize? งานเลลงตัดเนี่ยลอยมาติดที่หมู่บ้านแห่งหนึ่งแล้วมันก็เกิดเหตุการณ์ว่าเออนางนางเปื่อยมาแล้วก็ชาวบ้านก็เอาเสื้อผ้ามาใส่ให้ด้วยความที่ตกใจว่านางอ่ะไม่ได้ใส่เสื้อผ้าแล้วก็เกิดการแย่งชิงกันว่าเออเดี๋ยวฉันจะเอาไปดูเองดูแลเองอะไรอย่างนี้ค่ะ Well um, first of all she's she's telling the story um, about 
Red Lotus, and this is in the beginning of the story. Um, Red Lotus is Lotus is actually a woman who's who was naked, and she was naked and and float for um, throughout the river, and then she was found um, in a village. Um, and the people uh, who who didn't know where exactly she was from, where she was born, and how she was born, um, they um, decided to you know to take her in, um, and you know put clothes um, to, for her so she wouldn't be naked. Mm-hmm. But even that, they are you know uh, she she was struggling because they were like trying to like I want her, I want her, I want so everybody wanted pieces of her and that was when she was struggling because they were fighting um to get her or to get pieces of her mm. yeah to make something out of her yes yeah to make something. all right mm. um well uh, i mean that's that's uh that's a really interesting story but we're also very curious about the technique that you use um so um Can you explain a little bit about the way that you approach this uh, storytelling? เอ่อตัวเทคนิคเนาะเหมือนว่าตอนจะใช้เทคนิคในการคอลาดก็จริงแต่ว่าเรื่องแรกเราก็จะถ่ายภาพอยู่แล้วแหละถ่ายภาพ
um, supernatural way or, mm-hmm. or other ways or almost magical way, um, adding things to the story. Um, yes. yes. Thanks. Um, Rita, you're, you're nodding. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to uh, respond to that? Yeah, I was... I was um I think it's very interesting what you just said and also how stories always change every second that anybody else tells it, but also over generations and then also with like here, like literally different technologies. So also how different technologies bring up on new stories, upon stories, upon stories. I think, yeah, very interesting and also amazingly visible in this way. Yeah. <laughs> um, What I would really like to know is, um, because from a Western perspective, it's obviously differently received as from a Southeast Asian perspective, because we're not so familiar with the myths and the tales and the way that it's used and the traditions and the religious beliefs. So um, did you notice any difference in reactions coming from different part of, parts of the world? Uh, yeah, Asian ตัวนี้ก็ไปที่ไต้หวันใช่มั้ยครับก็ course i think that when exhibiting in different parts of the world the reactions would change um, depending on the background depending on the culture of of um, what that country or what the people um, have have background or memories of. Um, for example, when she exhibited in, in Japan, um, I think that I think that uh, the topic of feminism, the, t- the topic of um, gender equality um, has affected um, Japanese, especially Japanese women so much that they felt that it was so real and, and it hit them so hard. Um, in their hearts and which um, she said that they would you know um, go through um, all, all the myth the time myth and to understand it more um, because it, it it really hit their hearts เราด้วยความที่ตัวโลตาเนี่ยตุลาเอ้ยขอโทษค่ะดอกบัวเนี่ยมันเป็นเหมือนภาพจําของคนเอเชียเพราะว่ามันมักจะอยู่ใต้
Um, I think it's extremely interesting. I really like the, um, the thinking really on the aesthetic modes, like the layering, the, the layering and the fact of the reflection on the, um, on, the st- on the stories passing. And also, I think the main connection to my works is uh, also this element of the sort of the story tale, which in her case, it's the actual tale. But in, in my case, I focus more maybe on advertisement, on, on, on other kind of stories that are constantly told um, about sort of uh, ourselves and about uh, that are constructing really our imaginaries. So I feel like it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's extremely interesting. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, me too. Let's move on to, uh, to the Magic Cube project. Um, so to begin with, um, this uh, tiny cube that probably everybody knows and uh, recognizes is uh, central, uh, is, cent- is at the center of your work. So can you uh, explain why you chose to use this symbol specifically? Yes. So in 2013, 2014, I began to um, be interested on the on question of uh, propaganda, especially in advertisement and looking at the context of the car. And, um, and I decided to focus on the stock queue because it was the most prim- prominent sort of um, advertised object that I could see everywhere in, in the public sphere. And, and so I started to make some researches about it and, and I found the whole history of it quite fascinating fascinating in a, yeah, in a just, just so distorted f- way sorry just hello to, yeah do you hear me yeah yeah okay sorry yes i can uh, yeah sorry yes. to interrupt you but i was just wondering because uh you know we see a lot of advertising towards women all over the world uh but yeah. this has a has a has an extra layer uh to it uh uh, in your view, right? Can you can you explain what this is, how this is different, um, what this brand is doing in West Africa um, compared to all the beauty marketing that we get, um, you know, that that is that is communicated to us in our everyday lives. Sure. I mean. Um I was just indeed entering into the fact that as this product was so much advertised, it was quite fascinating to look at the fact that women were always at the center of this um, of this of this sort of uh, advertisement and as I was about to begin to say that it came into the, the West African market um, right after the Berlin conference. Yeah. So it's definitely, you know, a colonial product and it became uh, extremely widely used um, from mm. 19, 1886 onwards. And, um, to me, what was extremely interesting in in focusing again on the women as the advertisement were proposing, and um, and in this context, that it's uh, also my my uh, you know I'm Italian Senegalese, so my other country as well, uh, was the fact that first of all within the private sphere, I could see all my family members wearing all these advertised uh, sort of uh, matching I don't know how you call them, um, but yeah, cooking sort of dresses, yeah, mm-hmm. and they were advertised with uh, Maggie with Aja, with so many other brands. And it was quite fascinating to see how much of that was entering really in the, in the private lives of people. Mm-hmm. And, and also because the, uh, the slogans really of this, of this product were extremely uh, straightforward going with, uh, you know, with, with every woman, um, with, with Maggie, every woman is a star or with Maggie, your man, uh, your man is not going to look for a second wives or, mm-hmm. or, or, things as such. So it was also a little bit the irony, if you wish, mm-hmm. of, uh, of the semiotic language that was utilized by this, um, by this product, really, that, uh, that, found it, that I found extremely um, important to sort of underline. And also, I'll just conclude mm-hmm. the question of how much coloniality then becomes something that not only influences our imaginaries and our sort of, you know, histories, but rather also uh, our bodies, how much they, they literally end Centers, you know, in our bodies, and, and and what's the impact of that? So that's um, yeah. You, do you mean because you're? It's actually replacing traditional uh, cooking, because that's something. Yes. That, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, because it is so widely spread, widely widely used that indeed it uh, it became a substitution for many of the other spices that uh, are normally utilized, right? Because the composition, the anatomy of the stock cube itself is uh, extremely extremely um, I would say flexible in any kind of uh, environment. So even if you have forty degrees 
is under the shadow is still, you know, it's still work and it's extremely cheap as well as it is an industrial um, product. And um, and so the, the over usage of it, it, mm-hmm. uh, it obviously implicates a lot of other than issues for the health and, and yeah, this. Yeah, so it's actually claiming to be the traditional uh, way of cooking, uh, the way that it's that is communicating and and um, wow. Uh, let's have a look at your uh, let's have a look at your work, um, Rita. Can you yes. uh, can you reflect on this work? What do you think? Oh, there's so much to say. Yeah, start. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I think are very evident again in this work um, and that's something that you've also highlighted upon in many other ways but is like okay maybe I should have a like sh- very short introduction my father is from Burkina Faso so I also n- know the um, West African um, aesthetic and I would say that also now what I find very interesting um, what is happening in in Western Europe but I think if you can say the West, it's still very, very, a very popular aesthetic in the West now. A certain idea of what then Africa is. And um, this idea of, of Africa, um, which is this kind of uh, Malik Sidi Bey, um, Keita idea. And I think what is interesting and where you also play with is that this same aesthetic and is now also being shown in different ways by different artists right now on the continent but it's all mostly still from west africa and then but then very colorful so the images we know from these photographers from the 50s 60s are mostly are black and white and then we see these images with the like super bright colors um that are also in a way relatable to what you now see when you look at like quote unquote african Um, photography but also African art in a way like contemporary African art and it's an aesthetic that's very popular um, among African diaspora but also just now that idea of what then Africa is is very popular so I really like the way you play with that so Um, Aji Aji, um, can you respond to uh, what Rita is saying why did you specifically choose this technique yeah um, thank you very much for your um, for your comment Rita by the way Mm -hmm. and well, for me, again, then it was extremely important to think of how can I combine all this, uh, these observations that I had on this, uh, on this propagandistic sort of modes of, uh, of you know, the, the, the stock cubes into, and, you know, the history of it into an aesthetic of all that made sense and somehow, mm-hmm. yeah? So it was uh, the first way in which I thought about this project was very much looking at, uh, you know, this uh, Malik Sidi Bese Duqueta kind of photography. Mm-hmm. But later on, I started to sort of stop a moment and reflect upon why is it that I'm thinking right away of producing a work in this manner and uh, and not in any others. Mm-hmm. And and I think that what you said before, the that it's sort of expected, you know, about West African imaginaries or African imaginaries that it's um, um, that always has to go through in somehow this uh, this sort of uh, aesthetical pattern of you know the studio base and all of this was something that. Um, was inspiring on a one hand because I find the works of Malik Sidi Ben and all those other photographers amazing. Um, but on the others, I was quite preoccupied in, in, in the way in which these imageries were sort of dealt within the art market, yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is mostly a Western art market. And so through my work, uh, what I try to do, and that was also one of the reasons why it took so long to sort of develop it, was how do I deal also with the white gaze, you know, dealing with this, mm. with this, uh, with this material and how can I give a, a kind of, like, how can I confront it? Yeah. yeah. Um, towards this imaginary, towards a, a kind of a tautological, I would say, um, sort of observation and, and criticism. Yes. Of, of, uh, of what is the aesthetic that represents West Africa? Because I don't believe that it's necessarily only this, you know, photographic way in which uh, we can talk about um, this, this side of the world. And, um, but yeah, so this is a bit, yeah, what yeah. I wanted to say about, yeah. Thanks, that's very clear. Um, so I was just wondering about the masks. Why why did you choose to use the masks in some of the images? Uh, it was precisely for the reason that 
things that I just mentioned, meaning that how do I in somehow confront, again, the white, the white gaze looking at this material and potentially also fetishizing it, um, you know, in, uh, in, a, in a way that wouldn't reproduce that, that, uh, that fetishization, yeah? Mm-hmm. So what I found interesting was to look at how museums and, and, and collections also um, sort of... Uh, yeah, dealt uh, with uh, when, when, for instance, Malik Sidi Bey was alive, you know, you had all the sets uh, of, uh, you know, where people could go and take pictures of themselves in the same way that he was used to do in the 50s, 60s, which he was extremely happy to do. And it was, uh, you know, I, I think it was something amazing while he was uh, still here. Uh, but I rather, I don't know, um, I rather see um, in this, how can I say, how, in this sort of portrayal aesthetic, more of a wheel yeah of of uh, of looking how can i say it's it's like a way in somehow to um to give back <laughs> what yeah. is it that they want to see so you have like a white body that is holding a black mask yes mm-hmm. and that is presenting itself as extremely traditional as mm-hmm. uh, uh you know within this old magic cube uh, sort of uh, imaginary space and uh so that's yeah that's to me <laughs> the reason yeah. why i did that yeah. yeah um rita would you would you like to respond yeah um, or maybe <laughs> I was thinking because exactly what you just said about the white gaze is uh-huh. also something I'm thinking about a lot. So it's also but like and that's why I think it's interesting what you see in the image right now, how you how you in a way people are claiming back the gaze because they then or and then by they I mean the image or the, the, the subject on the on the image um, claims back the space by deciding what you see in a way. So in that way you're confronted back again with yourself as the viewer, or at least that's how I perceived it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very powerful. Yeah. yeah it does a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I'm also very curious about the um, the other reactions that you got. Actually, um, did 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 um, Nestle, the mother company of Maggie, actually ever respond to this work? Did you hear anything from them? Um, no, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I, I mean once upon a like some, some a long time ago when I did my first presentation of this Maggie project in Dakar, which was during a bayenno, I don't remember, 2014 maybe. Um, and I remember that I received an email from Maggie Senegal asking me to acquire the work, but then eventually that didn't work out, <laughs> so we didn't do that. <laughs> but that, that was about it, yes. That was yeah, it. because um, the, when did you release this work? Um, so I began it again in 2014 mm-hmm. uh, to sort of yeah release it, but uh, it took me quite a while to 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 finish it to to con- I don't know to find a form that made sense. Uh, so up until 2019, I continued it. Yes. So this is like for this this right. image is part of the first chapter of Magic Cube. Then the others are yeah. So it's evolving. Yeah. Right. The work's evolving. Um, so has the work actually been uh, seen outside outside of the art-related context? So uh, actually women in uh, Senegal and other West African countries, have they actually seen this work as well? Did you get any reactions from, from, from them? Yeah, I did. The, um, the, well, the, the Bayenio is still an art context where, where people are engaged and, and, you know, anyone is invited to go in. Um, so the Bayanio photography in Bamako, which was an extreme honor also to be shown in this project specifically mm-hmm. in Bamako, as it is the, the homeland <laughs> of, uh, of all those other amazing references that I used for this, for this project. And, um, you know, the, the, what it's interesting is the fact that um, what people are con- like, people get it right away <laughs> when they see yeah. this project. Yeah. I don't need to be explaining all those uh, layers that I that I uh, that I'm also happy to, to be describing because that's how I, I, I thought of it. But it's uh, it's beauty. It's really beautiful to see the Im- immediacy of uh, of people just understanding it, even though they're not in the arts or you know not necessarily interested. I don't know in photography or whatever. It's uh, it's clear. Yeah. So uh, that's yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would like to know actually from Common Luck um, what she thinks of your work. If we can. Uh, really, I 
มันมีความเป็นเครื่องมืออ่ะไม่ไม่ต่างกันกับความแบบของเรื่องเล่าของป้าเนาะแล้วเหมือนตัวเครื่องมือนั้นอ่ะมันก็ส่งอุดมการเกี่ยวกับเรื่องเพศมาด้วยอะไรเงี้ยค่ะ Um, she said that um, she can truly, truly see the connection um, between um, her work and and and, and her work. Mm-hmm. In terms, of it's it's there are the storytelling. Um, for example, um, her work says about the story about um, contemporary consumption, contem- contemporary um, capitalism in in terms of advertisement, which is a storytelling that has affected um, how we treat women today, or how the women are per- perceive themselves, or how we perceive women or the role of women today. Yeah. <laughs> ไปเห็นในสัมภาษณ์ของโฟมมาชอบที่มันเป็นประโยคหนึ่งที่ว่าถ้าคุณใช้แม็กกี้แล้วสามีคนจะไม่มีภรรยาน้อยอ่ะมันทําให้เห็นโครงสร้างเลยว่ามันเป็นมันยังคงให้ผู้หญิงอยู่ในครัวอะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะ the 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 sentence that really s t r u c t u r e um of what you said before um is the sentence I said the man is not going um is not going to look for a second wife if you You s m a c k y It really highlights how um, uh, how we dominate women and how women are usually seen in only in in kitchen or um, to cook or to clean or you know being um, dominated and domesticated within the house. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's something uh, uh, that's. Being gladly discussed a lot uh, around the world are uh, uh, restricted gender uh, roles. So um, thanks also for uh, reflecting on the work um, of IG. Um, I would like to move the conversation uh, towards the table, but you will of course be involved. It's a little bit of a challenge because we're working with a translator. So if any of you has any questions also um, for Common Luck, then just ask and we can translate it. Same goes for you, Aji. Um, so having heard all uh, this uh, commenting on their work, uh, is there anything that you would like to bring to the table? Yeah. I'm still trying to yes, a lot. get a lot it all to, yeah, get it all together, <laughs> make make sense of it, or for myself at least. Mm. Um, yeah, I would like to. I, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like do. to know from Aji. I don't know if you have any reflections mm. on this, but um, like with like if you compare like to if with Common Luck's work, there's like women are very evident. And um, uh, you see very clearly, or at least that's how I perceived it, how women um, are being forced into certain roles, and then again how the the subject on the image is taking back that gaze. And I think, in a way, that's how I also connected to IG's work. So how the subject in her images uh, is either taking the gaze. So there's this image of the woman. Um, Laying, you can see it a little bit now on the screen uh, uh, besides us. Mm-hmm. But the woman laying on the um, on the f- on this cushion on the floor with all the yeah, and I think there it's very interesting how it's not as if yeah, perhaps we look too, but she is taking the gaze, so she is demanding on which terms we can or cannot look at her, and also almost you it makes you almost awkward looking at her because you're like okay, well is this really my place to look right now? And I would like this is a very long intro. But I would like to know <laughs> what's the question? From, uh, yeah, <laughs> from Aji, how um, was there a difference? Because it was a long, a long research. Was there a difference in the images you took in the beginning, where you had like women really facing um, the camera or not facing the camera or like masks or was is yeah? How did that change within the project? <laughs> Well, it came about more of a, um, I don't know, it was just like a technical experimentation. So for, for a few years, I continued to photograph in a way that was always replicating the studio set. So having, you know, a backdrop that had all the Maggie advertisement mm-hmm. and then I was 
sort of composing everything, yeah. Um, but I found it at a certain point to be quite limiting into like, what is it that I could actually do with this, um, I don't know, with this old subject that I decided to tackle. And so I started to get more on, I don't know, I, I, I still worked in the studio, but I started to crop the images and then recreate the background as I wanted it to be. And it sort of freed me a little bit more into like, I don't know, a language more fluid and, and very direct in, in what I wanted to say. And also, um, you know, the fact of trying not to only just, again, replicate, you know, the same, the same studio, uh, the, the same positions as, you know, those iconic images of Keita and, and, and Sidi Bey. So like, what is it that I could bring in also as a, like a bit of a fresher generation <laughs> to say, <laughs> to say something, I guess. Yeah. So that's how it came about. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So in a way, also, can I have a... Sure, a, a, go ahead. <laughs> in, in a way, also, um, what Common Luck is doing by um, layering also in a way and having like collages and then making a picture of a picture and how these then stories kind of um, now layer on top of each other. In a way, IG is then also working in that way, right? So you reflect on the pictures and then see if you have perhaps more freedom by, by collaging as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's again really a question of uh, being fluent within, you know, the, the spectrum of photography and not just uh, having to think of, okay, I want to I want to be creating references to that, to that kind of, so therefore I have to be working in the same exact way. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of came to a point where I had more ownership of, of the image and of, uh, of what is it that I really wanted to say. And that was still present when I began the project, but uh, I was sort of missing perhaps some, uh, I don't know, some some point. I, I, I was blocked. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so um, yeah, it, it's, it's really, I don't know, it freed me a lot, you know, the, the, the fact of just doing whatever is it that I wanted with collages and, yeah, and recreating the layering, not only conceptually, but also, you know, in the image. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Um, was there, from from your point of view, Edgy, was there anything you would like to bring across uh, yourself we didn't ask you about your story? Um, no, I, I'm really, yeah, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> um, Emily, looking at um, what's been said tonight, um, can you give your reflection from your point of view of, uh, well, you explained in the beginning um, why you selected these two artists. Uh, now hearing their uh, stories, um, can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit more? Did you did you hear any new exciting things? No, maybe I would like to add something and yes, also then please. ask something to Kamulak because what is also something we couldn't see now because we just see the 2D the images like they are there, but of course in the exhibition, both Kamulak and Aji really work with installation as well, meaning uh, Aji also pointed at it, that she really also takes over the space behind the images using paint. Like It's really beautiful also now in the show in the museum that no one has seen yet, yeah. uh, how they're actually, for both of the artists, uh, there's this element of installation and the element of how are the objects placed and also they're playing with how can this context where the image is hanging not be a white cube for example or also use references and uh, in uh, Adi's work of course we see it also through how she installs the images themselves but maybe Kamulak you want to say something about how you also choose the frames in a specific manner you work with wallpaper so the fragment of the story is also present in your presentation. คือพอในตัวอินสตอลเลชันน่ะมันต้องการให้ภาพมันดูใหญ่แล้วก็อยู่ในso she highlights that she wants the story to be um, to be massive. Mm -hmm. So the photograph is massive, um, and some of the photographs are framed with you know golden, just ancient, old golden frames. Because in terms of 
you know, in our culture, when we see the golden frames, we would we would see something that as something that is sacred, something that is, that is important, something that um, um, has some kind of history that is important to us in terms of belief. So that's what she she wants to highlight in her in her installation. And also, I think that um, she said that in the installation, it because it is a storytelling. So um, the the photography itself doesn't say um, the story of a whole. So she wants to um, guide the viewers through the story and how the story has shifted and changed. For example, there is a scene that um, um, that highlights how women's uh, women's period, women women's uh, menstruation, is actually. Um, cursing the man's power so it's it's rather a stigma to 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 men's power and it's weakening the men so um, in our culture uh, it has affected us all which means that you know some of the temples that we go when we have uh, our period or when, when we have our menstruation we cannot enter that sacred that important place just because we are women with with period and our period are cursed so that is is also the main story um, which focuses on how gender inequality has has um, affected us and how what, what is the beginning and the root of gender inequality which comes from this Thai myth. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have another question for, for Common Luck, uh, actually for both of you. Um, can you um, say a little bit how um, the research that you did for your projects um, actually um, affects your, your personal views on themes uh, such as feminism, post-colonialism, in your case, uh, religion also? Uh, Common Luck, yeah. Uh, you can translate it if, if that's necessary. มันมันเอฟเฟกต์ในตัวของเวลาทํางานเอฟเฟกต์ตัวของ <coughs> พี่พามพูดการพูดถึงเรื่องเพศโดยที่อยู่ในคํานิยามของศาสนาคือเอาเข้าไปเอาตัวเองเข้าไปศึกษาในเรื่องนั้นคือสิ่งหนึ่งม
So, so um, they just they just for me um, out of love. Yeah, thanks for sharing that very personal story. Thank you. Um, Aji, um, for you, the same question. How did your research uh, uh, influence your, your personal view on these, uh, these big topics, these big themes? Mm. Well, I think that uh, it's, it's more like my political views that have influenced my research than yeah. other, the other way around, meaning that it's, uh, it's the, the research becomes a space in which I, I, I sort of managed to find a language to, to, to really give my political views also on these matters that in this case are having to do with, uh, with you know, neoliberal uh, sort of colonialism that we have through, um, through um, objects, through, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, food and through many other things and how and the other thing that I'm also very in general very interested about it's uh, it's, it's the question of the public sphere and how much of that and the, the political signs that are present in the public sphere those going from the advertisement to um, you know to, 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 to constructions of uh, I don't know institutions or whatever else you have you um, sort of influence uh, you know the storytelling that we have then of ourselves and and, and, and the way in which we perceive ourselves. So I, I think that, again, what I'm doing, it's rather, yeah, it's it's pretty evident, I think, in work, it, that, that these are my political views, really. <laughs> so I had a great question coming in. Um, do you actually use the mega cubes yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, for a long time I did not, and then uh, sometimes I have to say that I'm also weak, and um, <laughs> it might happen it's, that a little quarter. It's convenient. In some <laughs> yeah, we're all human. I we're try all... to go with the beer one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're all we're all human. Um, we're. Um, Heading towards the end, so I would like to uh, ask you, um, Aji, what are you currently working on? Um, well, at the moment, I'm continuing a research I began in 2019 on the National Iconographic, Iconographic Archive in Dakar. Um, and I'm very much interested on, uh, and again, the, always the matter of the public sphere and how we're sort of building the, the urbanistic sort of uh, aspect but, uh, you know, of a, of a city, especially always in the car. Um, and, uh, and yes, so I'm, I'm kind of looking into this relationship of how much, you know, an iconographic archive can be influential in sort of telling uh, today's uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, like struggles um, that, that, you know, people can, can be living in a post-colonial sort of space. Cool. And, uh, and yeah, pretty much that in a very vague. <laughs> so, and, and in the in the meantime, yeah. uh, when people would like to see more of you, where where can they find you? Your Instagram website? How can they find you? Uh, my website, it's www.ag.com. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, Come on, luck for you. The same question to uh, to finish as well this conversation. What are you working on currently? Okay, so she's researching uh, more, which is also like a parallel. Uni um, universe, a parallel um, series that goes with wet water. So, so she's digging towards more in terms of, you know, um, the combination between religions and how it has changed. So from animalism to um, Brahmin religion to Buddhism and, and how it has shaped us to today. So she's, she's working on, on that in, into a bigger, a bigger series. Yeah. เอ่อโอเคตัวโฟโต้บุ๊คก็จะเป็นอื่นๆคอนเซ็ปต์บุ๊คที่เป็นเรื่องเล่าเรื่องเดียวกันแต่ถูกเล่าจากศิลป์เ
um, the photo book is, is Red Lotus, but it is translated or is told by different artists. For example, there's uh, Thai portraits um, and you know collage photography from other artists of how they are um, reflecting on, on Red Lotus. Oh, wow. And that's amazing. And where, where can we get it? Where, where can we get it? Yang, <laughs> where uh, Okay, she's she's doing it now. Um, okay. So, it's, so um, when it's finished, um, she will launch. And are you gonna launch on your website? Yes. Oh, keep one at the so she's going to launch in her website next year. Yeah, okay. Well, we will, we will be looking forward to that. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight, both of you, uh, all three of you, to be uh, to be precise. And thank you, uh, Rita and Emily, for joining me here in the studio tonight thank as you. well. I think it was a great conversation. Uh, it was the final edition of the series um, that FOAM uh, developed around FOAM Talent. Uh, 2020 in collaboration with Bakhuizus Weiger. Um, hopefully we will be able to visit the exhibition soon in person, but in the meantime, um, if you get the opportunity, please uh, visit the virtual exhibition. It's, it's really worth it, I can promise you that. Um, and for Bakhuis, there's um, live casts every day, so um, all different kinds of uh, topics. So check the website regularly, regularly um, for the program. So um, for now, uh, have a good evening. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in and see you next time. Bye. Thank you.